give yourself a round of applause because um, this is the hard work that we get to go and turn your story into purpose. Um, so welcome to Call on Congress uh, webinar. I'm excited to see and all these chats coming in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give us a quick introduction. I am Olivia Henswell. I'm the senior program manager with Fight CRC on the advocacy team. So I get to really hone in on the grassroots advocacy efforts um, here with Fight CRC. But I want to make sure that the full advocacy team does get a moment to introduce themselves. Brian, do you want to start? Of course, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Thomas. I am the advocacy advocacy project manager here at Fight CRC. Brian is new to our advocacy team, so everyone give him a very warm welcome. Um, I'm Molly McDonald. I'm the vice president of advocacy for Fight CRC, um, based here in Chicago, and really looking forward to seeing all the folks who are coming back um, again to call on Congress and meeting all the new faces that we will have this year. Some other faces that I want to make sure that I bring to light um, is the mentor team. And so we have a handful of them. Um, but if you have not gotten in contact with your mentor, then make sure you check your emails um, and get into Community of Champions. That is going to be the best. Did I just, I think I froze a little bit. Okay. Froze for a minute, but you're back. All right, I'm back. So something that I'm going to do is I'll include all of these points in a follow-up email after this. Um, one of those links is going to be into Community of Champions, um, and that is going to be where you can find your mentor team. So we have got a handful of them. Um, these are the, the faces that you can always find during Call on Congress, um, and they'll be able to help you as well. So make sure you give some love to your mentors. They work hard. They're awesome. All right. So for this training um, webinar, some what we're going to go over is going to go over the Call on Congress agenda going over an advocacy overview, going over the call on Congress asks, uh, meeting with lawmakers and a Q&A. So you will be able to really um, get some good information uh, from this webinar that we will be able to use there in DC. And then if you have questions, just go ahead and answer or put them into that question and answer chat um, and we'll be sure that we answer those. Okay, so going over the agenda, um, Saturday, March 9th is Flag Day. This is an optional day, um, but at 8.30, we will have the United in Blue Volunteer Day kickoff. Um, so it's just kind of like a mini rally that morning, um, really kicking off the, the Volunteer Day. Um, and, but then from 9 to 5, we will be placing flags there at United in Blue. Sunday, March 10th is kind of the call on Congress kickoff day. So all these events are going to be at the hotel, the Holiday Inn at the Washington, Washington Capitol. And so we'll start the day um, from eight to two, we're going to have a call on Congress check-in. So whenever you have um, time within that, go ahead and check in. We will be there down in the lobby. You will not be able to miss us. Look for blue. That's where we will be. Um, from 10 to 12, though, we have an optional junior advocate meetup. And so this is going to be just selected time um, and sp specific time for us to kind of nurture those junior advocates and, and their um, knowledge around advocacy and being able to turn their, their story into purpose as well. But from two to five, we have the Call on Congress kickoff and the Fight CRC Expo. So I'd really encourage you to get there at two because on the hour, we're, all, we're gonna have some live demos um, and just some different opportunities that you can get with the community um, as well as meet your fellow advocates within um, the Fight CRC advocacy community. Um, but then we're gonna end with a mix and mingle. We'll have bites and beverages. And so we'll have from five to 6.30 at that mix and mingle, and then we'll have dinner with the state teams. And so we'll be able to really meet those teams um, that we will be going into those um, meetings with, and that is where we'll be able to really hone in there. Monday, March 11th is training. Um, again, all events are going to be at the Washington um, Capitol Holiday Inn. So we start with breakfast in the morning. We will then go into training from Advocacy 101 and the Policy Ask Refresher. Um, we'll have lunch, and then we will come back to training um, how to have a successful meeting with your members of Congress. We'll have a short break, and then we will have a celebration of Hope Dinner. And so that will be a very um, packed day with, of information, but it will be a very, um, very 
take all that knowledge into that next day and that is with meetings so tuesday march 12th is the rally and congressional meeting Oh, you lost Liv. You back? I, I'm back. I don't know what's happening. Okay, hold on. What did you last hear? We just started on the rally day. Okay, perfect. Let me share this again. Okay. So rally day, we um are having breakfast early at the hotel from six to seven thirty. Um, we will start loading those buses at seven o'clock. Um, and so we will be um, ushering people to the buses. So if you are done with breakfast by seven, we can get you over there to the rally early, earlier um, and you can be at that installation. Um, but rally at United in Blue will start at eight o'clock. Um, and then we will have that moment there at the flags. Um, and then we will get us through security starting at nine. But then congressional meetings will start at 10. And so congressional meetings will start being scheduled at 10. It will go until 4 p.m. Um, and then from four to six, we'll have a call on Congress um, closing ceremony in the Capitol Visitor Center. That is optional, but it is a great way to invite your members um, to even come and meet more of the community. Um, but this is just going to be a closing ceremony for us to really wrap up the day, um, connect with the community one more time before we leave um, and maybe not see each other until another March. But um, we are going to make sure that we close out with with that ceremony with all of us. So. One of the biggest questions, what do I wear? So what to wear, it's very important. March 9th, volunteer day, I would say comfortable, be layers, um, watch, the, watch the temperature. Um, March could, you know, in DC could be 65 degrees, it could be 35 degrees. So just make sure you keep an eye on that. Um, March 10th, which call on Congress kickoff in that dinner, very casual, um, come in, you know, comfort is key. So jeans, sneakers, fight CRC or CRC blue is great. Um, March 11th, the training and the dinner day. Again, casual for the training and the policy ask refreshers. Um, but the celebration dinner, um, I would say bring your best blue. Um, this could be a blue suit, cocktail dress or jeans, blue shirt, whatever you feel best celebrating in. I will say that I'm gonna have a blue wig. So that's my best blue. Um, March 12th, I we've got, that's the rally and congressional meetings, business casual blue, nice jeans, slacks, of, of, of course, comfortable shoes because we'll be walking through um, the halls. And so that is gonna be within the um, frequently asked questions document and link that I will send in the email um, after this meeting. So you don't have to remember this. I'll send this out. Don't worry about that. But if there's any questions right now about right there, before three can, you know what? I would call um, call the hotel and I can always provide that in the email. Oh, I can answer that. Okay, I'll answer that in the chat. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off to Molly who's gonna go over advocacy. Um, thanks, Olivia. Um, so now that you have kind of the lay of the land um, and what to expect, and like we said, we will send all of this information afterwards so you don't have to memorize it here. Um, but obviously, you all kind of understand the value of ad advocacy because you're here. Um, but it's, I just really want to stress how important it is and how much we appreciate and value that you're taking time out of your day and out of your busy schedules to come to Washington, D.C. to share your story and to advocate for, um, you know, these policies on behalf of the colorectal cancer community. Um, you know, if we don't share our story, no one else is going to do it for us. So it's just so incredibly important that we um, educate our members of Congress and their staff. Next slide, please. Um, and so what I really want to emphasize today, among other things, but is that you are your best advocate. You are the expert in your story. So we don't expect you to be policy experts and, and your members of Congress don't expect that. We will give you all of the tools that you need and all of the information that you need, but don't feel like you have to know, you know, every single statute inside and out. What you are your expert in is your story, and that story is incredibly powerful. And it's what our elected officials need to hear. So they 
need to understand what your experience has been, what it's like being a part of the colorectal cancer community. Um, and so, you know, we want to really become a trusted resource for our members of Congress so that they can come to us when they have challenges and when they have questions around um, colorectal cancer. Um, and to really develop these champions who then can go forward um, on Capitol Hill and help advocate for policies that are important to us. Next slide. So this is, again, kind of some of more of the same, but, um, you know, it's, I think, given um, the political climate these days, it can be um, easy to want to sort of shy away from advocating, shy away from, you know, engaging with your elected officials. And, and I don't blame anyone for that. But I think what we really have to focus on is being able to cut through that noise um, and, you know, get in, tell our stories and, and really have a powerful impact. And so despite all of the things that are happening on the news and all of the craziness, we still have a really amazing opportunity to do that and to influence change, to educate and to build relationships. Um, and that's what this is all about. And so I want to also emphasize that, you know, we will be going to the Hill for, you know, one day in March, but advocacy is so much broader than just one day. And so for those of you who, if this is your first time, I want you to really look at it that way of like, this is one day, this is your first day, hopefully of many days of, you know, building those relationships, engaging with your member of Congress, um, and, and really kind of taking your advocacy year round. And we hope to give you the tools to do that. Next slide. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is um, go over our policy asks for this year. So a couple of notes on this. One, if you haven't um, taken our um, advocacy training in Community of Champions, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, so that's a self-paced um, virtual advocacy training in our online platform, Community of Champions. We can put a link to it in the chat but it's just a good kind of self-paced way to start to familiarize yourself with those asks. We'll again, go over them today, um, give you the opportunity to ask questions, but then we'll again, go over them in person in DC. So you'll really get, you know, kind of multiple bites at the apple just to get comfortable with these asks. Um, in addition, when we're in DC, we'll have speakers who can kind of speak to um, these programs in real life and what they really mean. I know that's a lot of acronyms, it's a lot of numbers, um, and so we're going to really do our best to try and break it down and, and bring things to life. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that the reason that why we focus on these asks in particular, so I'll get into them in a second, but they're both um, funding related asks. So this time of year is known as appropriation season on Capitol Hill. So basically that's budget season. Um, so this is the time when members of Congress are working to um, build the budget for the federal government. And so this time of year is really important that we advocate for budget items that are important to us. Are these the only policies that we care about? No, there's a lot of other policies, a lot of other issues that that Fight CRC cares about, that we know you all care about. But it's really important that we, you know, focus on these at this time of year. And then again, like I said, we want this to be one day in your advocacy, but not one and done. Um, we want you to continue to to build that relationship with your member of Congress um, so that we can continue to advocate on um, you know, all the issues that are important to this community. Next slide. Okay, so let's start with the CDC Colorectal Cancer Control Program or CRCCP. Um, I will try to not use the acronym just so that we're talking about the full program, but again, I recognize CDC, CRCCP, sounds like gobbledygook. Um, but the Colorectal Cancer Control Program is a program that's operated by the CDC, which focuses on increasing screening rates among people ages 45 to 75, particularly in underserved communities. So the, C the Colorectal Cancer Control Program um, funds um, programs through health departments, university, universities, and tribal organizations. So it's a grant program. So they provide grants to most often it's clinics to help them implement different strategies to help increase colorectal cancer screening rates in those communities. So again, it's often 
primarily in underserved communities where the screening rates are really, really low, and they need additional support to help get people screened. So to Currently, they fund 35 programs in 32 states. Um, and so what our hope is that we can ultimately increase funding for this program so that they can expand their, their work to additional clinics and additional states. Um, and so what's important about the colorectal cancer control program is that um, they really use strategies that have been proven to be effective for increasing colorectal cancer screening. So they help clinics implement these strategies um, and are able to help raise the screening rate. So some of those strategies are um, a reminder system for both medical professionals and patients when it's time for screening. So think about those kind of automatic maybe texts or emails or phone calls that you get from your doctor reminding you to get your flu shot or get um, certain screenings. It seems like a really simple thing, but not every physician's office does it. And so that can be a huge help in helping to make sure that people actually get in the office and do the screening that they need to do. Um, they also help with strategies um, that make it easier for patients to come in. So um, as many of you probably understand and maybe have experienced, there's a lot of barriers that exist just getting into the door to get screened, whether it's um, getting there, you know, transportation, whether it's childcare, taking time off of work, um, you know, complications with the paperwork, um, not understanding the process. Obviously, with um, colorectal cancer screening for colonoscopy in particular, you have to do the prep before you come in. And so kind of having people there to help um, walk folks through that process is another really helpful tool that, that folks use. And then, of course, using multiple different um, screening options. Next slide. So what is our ask? So our ask is to, to support $51 million for the CDC's colorectal cancer control program in the FY25 Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriations Bill. So I'm going to skip over the why for a second and get to the how. So again, that ask sentence, it's a lot of words. It's a lot to remember. But what's most important is that the process for supporting this through the appropriations process are these sign-on letters. So members of Congress can create a letter to an appropriations committee to say, this is my priority, this is what I would like you to include in the federal funding bill as it moves forward. And then different members of Congress can add their name to that letter to say, yes, we agree, we support this. And the more support that that letter gets, the better chance it has of ultimately being included in the final bill. So, we, on both the House side and the Senate side, have worked with congressional champions to create these letters. And so the ask, um, in order to support this $51 million for the colorectal cancer control program, is to sign on to um, the letter in support of it. So in the House, it's led by Congressman Donald Payne Jr., um, and in the Senate, it's led by Senator Cory Booker. So... We are in the process of finalizing those letters now. We will have a copy for everyone um, when they arrive in DC and so that they can bring it to their member of members' offices. Um, and you'll be able to kind of, you know, see what it looks like and um and share it with those offices. Um, but again, kind of going back to the importance of this. There are approximately 44 million people in the U.S. that are eligible for colorectal cancer screening, but as many as one in three are not up to date on screening. So we know that colorectal cancer is preventable if caught early, um, and so can be preventable if caught early. And so it's really important to invest in these programs that are working to get more average risk individuals screened. So I also want to emphasize that this program is for those who are at average risk for screening. So not folks with family history or with genetic disorders um, or other um, things that could put them at a higher risk. Um, and so that's important to note as well. And so this $51 million is an increase of um, just about $7 million. And so um, we are hopeful that, again, that this will help, um, you know, allow them to expand the good work that they're doing um, and ultimately get more people screened and hopefully save more lives. Next slide, please. Okay, ask number two, more 
acronyms. Um, so if we want to kind of put our asks into buckets, the colorectal cancer control program is in the screening bucket. Um, and the um, this next asks, ask is in the research bu bucket. Um, so what um, many people may not know or may be surprised to know is that um, the Department of Defense um, conducts medical research. So they have a program called the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, within which they have a number of different programs where they fund medical research. Um, and so those topics are identified um, each year by Congress. And the DOD research program is really meant to be a um, complement to what happens at the National Institute of Health. So um, NIH or the National Institutes of Health is what people often think of when they think of um, federal research funding. Also incredibly important, um, but DOD medical research is, um, you know, kind of thought of as a little bit more high risk, high reward. Um, some of the pro um, projects that might be a little more out there that maybe the NIH wouldn't be comfortable funding. Um, and so it really creates a really nice complement um, to to NIH um, research funding. Um, and they really focus on solutions that will lead to cures or meaningful improvement in patient care, in improvements in patient care. Um, and they also really work to include consumer advocates or patient advocates throughout the process. So um, we actually you know, have um, advocates who have sat on their consumer review board. So looking through the grant proposals to help understand, you know, from that patient lens, um, what, is this something that would be meaningful to patients? Do we need to think about sort of other aspects of the research um, to make it um, more meaningful to patients? And so within the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, there are some programs that are disease specific. So for example, there's a lung cancer program, there's a breast cancer program, there's an ALS research program. Um, but then there's also buckets that are kind of more catch-alls. So there's a program called the peer review cancer research program. That's kind of a catch-all bucket that um, cancers can be eligible for, and then they compete against one another for a limited pot of dollars. Colorectal cancer has been eligible for funding through the peer-reviewed cancer research program um, almost since its inception, so um, for over a decade. Um, so we are grateful that colorectal cancer is receiving some funding through that program, but every year, one, we have to fight to make sure that colorectal cancer stays as, in, as part of that program, and two, each year, the number of cancers that are in that program has grown. So now there's even more cancers that are competing for, again, that limited pot of dollars. So next slide. So we believe that it's important that colorectal cancer receive its own research program within the Department of Defense Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. So. Again, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of death for men and women combined, and it's increasing in young people. Um, it's now the leading cause of cancer death for men under the age of 50 and the second for in women. And we don't understand why this is happening. So more research is incredibly important to be able to understand why this is happening and develop interventions to change those statistics. Um, it's also important to note that colorectal cancer is the only cancer of the top five cancer killers not to have its own program. So I have a chart on that on the next slide that we'll get to in a second. Um, but we know that there's good science happening in this space. We're funding good research through the peer-reviewed cancer research program, but we're leaving good science on the table. So in FY22, the last year that we have data available, the Department of Defense received 66 colorectal cancer applications in the peer-reviewed cancer research program. Of those, 25 were deemed meritorious. So they you know, got a good review essentially, um, but only nine of those applications were funded. So um, there's, there's more good science out there that um, is available and that we should be funding. Um, and so again, um, the way that we can ask our members of Congress to support this is to sign onto a letter that's led by our champions in support of this ask. So makes it easy. Again, we have the same champions in the House, Congressman Donald Payne Jr., and the same champion in the Senate, Senator Cory Booker. 
So again, we're finalizing those letters now with those offices and we'll have them available for you when you get to DC. Um, next slide. So again, just to further emphasize that colorectal cancer is the odd man out in terms of not having its own colorectal cancer program. Um, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer all have their own, uh, excuse me, their own research programs within the Department of Defense. And so it is time that colorectal cancer gets one as well. Next slide. Okay, we made it through our two funding asks. Again, buckets, screening, research. Um, now the final ask is um, to have your member join the colorectal cancer caucus. So a few things to note about this. <clears throat> First of all, what is a caucus? Um, a, the colorectal cancer caucus in particular is a bipartisan group of members of Congress dedicated to working collaboratively to increase access to screening, advance research, um, and ultimately find a cure for colorectal cancer. So this is basically a group of members of Congress who have come together to say, we believe that colorectal cancer needs to be a priority and we are gonna work together to figure out how to do that. So they also help to you know, raise awareness and be an amplifier for us and our stories um, on Capitol Hill. So not only can you know, they look at policy change, but also they are there to tell their colleagues about colorectal cancer you know, and, and hopefully develop additional champions um, as well. So um, the caucus is co-chaired by um, Congressman Donald Payne Jr., a name that should be familiar by now, um, and Congressman Mark Green of Tennessee. So it's bi bipartisan. Congressman Payne is a Democrat. Congressman Mark Green is a Republican. Both have um, a personal connection to colorectal cancer. So Congressman Payne um, lost his father to colorectal cancer, um, and his father was actually a member of Congress. And so when his dad passed away, he took over his seat in Congress. Um, and he's been a really incredible champion for us for, for many, many years. And then Congressman Green um, is a colorectal cancer survivor himself. And so um, he's new a new co-chair to the caucus, so we're grateful to have him and again, have that bipartisan support. Um, next slide. So again, um, the ask for this, this the one difference with this ask is that this is just for um, your U.S. House representative. Um, so not all caucuses are just focused on the House. Some um, are in the House and Senate, but they're more common in the House. Um, the House has 435 members where the Senate only has 100. So kind of the need to band together in groups and in a caucus is kind of um, more common in the House. So we tend to see them more there. So um, again, every state, every district in the U.S. is impacted by colorectal cancer. And in order to change policy, in order to make an impact, we have to build those champions on Capitol Hill. Um, and so this is one way that we can do that to kind of bring members together around a common cause and to help them be advocates both in DC and back home for colorectal cancer. And again, this is why it's so important to, you know, absolutely come to DC and participate and call on Congress, but then also to take this home with you um, and do, um, you know, engage in, in advocacy all year round. Um, and so, um, again, we will have you'll have all of this information in a really handy dandy printed beautiful training manual um, that our communications team is putting together. So you'll have all of this, you know, printed and in front of you. Um, but so here's a current list of the Colorectal Cancer Caucus. There's about 15 members so far. So if you see your member on there, woohoo, that's awesome. Make sure to thank them when you meet them. Um, and if you don't see your member on there, then it's a perfect, you know, way to, to introduce yourself and to ask them to join you. Next slide. Okay, so um, obviously once we have all of this policy knowledge, then we are going to take it to meet with our elected officials. Um, and so um, again, having that opportunity to have a personal meeting is 
so important to put, you know, a face and a name to, um, you know, statistics or a policy change. Um, there's just really no, um, no substitute for it. And so, um, you know, this is, again, a way that you can build these relationships with members of Congress and their staff. Um, so we are very fortunate that this year, members of Congress will be in town. It's not recess, they will be in session. But there will be some meetings where you meet directly with your elected official, with your member of Congress or your senator. Um, but there will be some where you meet with your with their staff. So I will I will disclose, as a former staffer for a member of Congress, you may say that I'm biased. But I will say, meeting with staff is just as important, if not maybe more, than meeting with your member of Congress. To have that relationship with the staff is so important because members of Congress are juggling all different types of issues in all different types of spaces. They're meeting with constituents and different stakeholders all day long. And so to have that staff person to, to make sure that this issue continues to be at the top of their desk, at the top of their mind, is so, so important. So I just always have to plug that um, you know, don't don't be too disappointed if you meet with staff because they have a lot more sway, even despite how young they may be, <laughs> than you would think. Um, and also, I just want to reiterate again, I recognize that, um, again, there are many, many issues that um, we care about as a colorectal cancer community. And so I don't want folks to feel like, okay, if this these two, these three issues that we're um, advocating for, it's not what was at the top of your list that, um, you know, that it's, it's um, you know, not worth it or something like that. It's so important that we're able to have a shared consistent message um, because that just strengthens what we're saying. If we have all of us together um, saying the same thing, that's so much stronger than all of these voices saying something different. And again, this is just one opportunity to engage with your members of Congress. There are opportunities all throughout the year that you can, you know, continue to engage them and to continue to talk about um, all of the issues that are important to you um, as um, their constituent. Next slide. Okay, so next, I'm very excited to introduce um, a special guest of ours, um, a returning call on Congress advocate um, and 13 year colorectal cancer survivor, Kathy Bowers. Um, so she's going to talk a little bit about sharing your story. So that's obviously a huge part of what we're doing in DC. And um, the way that you would share your story um, to your member of Congress looks different than you might share it with a friend or family member or perhaps in a media interview. And so really kind of focusing how you tell your story and, and honing that is really important. And so Kathy's going to give you some tips and tricks for how to think about that and how to do that. So Kathy, if you want to come off of mute and we'll let you take it from here. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Molly, for that very nice introduction. Um, as Molly said, I'm a 13 year survivor of stage 3B rectal cancer. And last year was my first year at Call on Congress. So the adv advocacy team thought it may be a good idea if a somewhat newbie could give some suggestions on what I learned during my first year and um, some takeaways that I have. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is something that's really important. And that is putting together your story. And the reason why I'm saying keep your story brief, because I know that probably sounds, but I have a lot to say, of course you do. But I, I was really surprised at how fast our meeting goes. And you may only, your team, your state team may only have 15 to 20 minutes. Um, to talk to your representative, congressperson, or their, their employee, their aide. So here's some suggestions I'm going to make. Start thinking now how you want to present your story. So think of about five to six sentences that will explain your story as best as possible. Write them down and start reading them and memorizing them. So you have your story down. As soon as you walk into that meeting, you're ready to go. 
Um, and I think another important thing is to practice, 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 even practice with your team. There's plenty of time for you to meet with your team. You can practice with each other. Um, at that point, you may want to decide you go first, you go second, you go third. So you're very organized before you actually go into the meeting. And um, also, um, I guess the next thing I wanted to talk about was the, the policy ask. Now, Molly did an absolutely fantastic job of explaining them, but I don't know about you, but that's a lot of information and it can be overwhelming. So I'm going to suggest you really start paying attention to those policy asks now and trying to teach, your, teach yourself them as best as you can now so that you're prepared when you attend a uh, call on Congress. And the other reason why um, really try to start learning those policy asks is it can be part of your story. When you tell your story, you may be able to add on, incorporate how one of those policy asks could have helped you or is helping you. So the bottom line there is keep the story brief and add on the policy ask if you can. Um, and now I wanna suggest something else. And that is something that really helped me without me really even realizing it last year. And that is do some research on your lawmakers. Um, I kind of fell into that accidentally last year. I found out through some research and talking to a friend that my senator was very much into women's issues. And, what, and when I told my story, um, I said, yes, I was diagnosed when I was age, age 50. And I was fortunate that the doctors believed me. And when I told them my symptoms, I immediately got a colonoscopy. But as I met other women in their 20s and 30s and heard their stories, and I was told how they weren't believed, um, it really made me angry. So I added that into my story and made it a woman's issue because I discovered that women's issues were very important to my senator. So um, we got a little bit of pushback uh, from the legislative aid um, saying that, well, you know, the senator doesn't really play favorites. So, you know, that gave me a chance to do a little pushback back, especially because the legislative aid caught on to my uh, addition to the women's issues. And he actually came back to me after we all told our stories and asked me more questions and specifically said, oh, I didn't know this was also a women's issue. So my suggestion is find out what your representative, your senators, um, special issues are and see if there's any way to incorporate that into your story. In other words, be a little tricky without going too far away from our policy asks. So now I've given myself a, an assignment and that is I'm asking myself how I can better include the women's issues, the, the, the issues that the younger women are facing and include that into my, my story. And um, then, you know, be ready for those questions and then see if there's any way without getting too far away from what we're asking in the policy issues, if there's any way that I can kind of incorporate women's issues into those policy asks. So in other words, I'm being a little tricky, but at the same time, I'm catching the attention of the Senator or the Senator's aide so that they're gonna pay a little bit more attention. Yeah, it's tricky and yeah, I'm being sneaky, but you know, that's okay with me. Um, so the final thing I wanna say to you is have fun while you're there. Yes, call on Congress is serious business, but you are in the nation's capital. If you, please take the time to see the sights and more importantly, make friends. Um, I have uh, made so many friends through going to colorectal cancer um, organizations events who are, they started out with being um, someone I just met to somebody that I really rely on when I need someone to talk to. So if you see someone standing around alone or in a group, don't hesitate to go up and introduce yourself and meet new people. 
Um, and if you see me there, it's kind of hard to miss the red hair. If you see me there, um, please, by all means, come up, introduce yourself to me. I would love to hear your story. And with that, I'll just end with, see you all in DC. Amazing. Thank you, Kathy. That was so great. We really appreciate it. And I would just echo um, Kathy's tip to research your members of Congress. So at the very least, you will see your U.S. House representative and your two senators. Um, and so to do a little research on them beforehand to figure out what issues are important to them, even to figure out where they're from, where they went to college. My old boss went to Lehigh University and anytime someone came in and said, hey, I'm a Lehigh grad, he always remembered that. And it was just a way to, again, continue to build that personal connection. So, um, okay, moving right along, next slide. Um, so we, I guess before we move to the next slide, but you can keep this slide up. Um, we, a note that we took from folks last year is we will have a lot of dedicated time this year for you in your state groups. Um, so that's time to kind of sit and hone your story, figure out what you want to say, how you want to connect it to the asks, but also to sit with the group of folks that you're going to be going from office to office with to figure out who's going to say what, how you want the flow of the meeting to go, and kind of make that game plan before you get in the room. Um, and so, again, we'll go over all of this stuff again in person in D.C., but at a very high level, kind of the general flow of your meeting is you're going to start with introductions. Um, each person can go around, briefly share their story, certainly where they're from. Um, again, they love to kind of know where their constituents are and where they're from. Um, and so make sure to include, you know, your town when you're introducing yourself. Um, and then you'll have the opportunity to present the policy asks. So again, in your kind of pre-game meetup with your group, you can just can um, kind of divvy up who's going to talk about which ask, who's most most comfortable, who has kind of um, has it down, and and maybe in meetings you kind of go back and forth. So maybe with one meeting one person presents the DoD ask, and another meeting another person does it. But you guys can kind of figure that out beforehand um, as a group. Um, and then you know you'll have time for discussion. So. Um, some staffers may not have any questions, some may have a lot. Um, and so you can kind of have that back and forth. Um, again, if it's totally okay if you don't know the answer to something, um, definitely don't make it up. Um, it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I don't have the answer to that, but I'll get back to you um, with the answer. And that's actually a great way to, to kind of keep that relationship going, to do that follow-up, to email them after, to be like, hey, remember when we met? This is the answer to that question. Um, and um, again, then, you know, kind of wrap things up. I think, you know, it's important to kind of ask, um, you know, clearly if they'll support our asks and if they, you know, need time to think about it, when you can follow up to make sure um, that you get an answer from them. Um, and then definitely take a photo. So um, we love to have folks take a strong arm with their members or staff um, so they can post it and um, sort of celebrate that meeting. So again, kind of what I spoke to before, you'll have that time before you hit the hill to, to assign roles and responsibilities and kind of figure out who's going to say what. So um, who's kind of going to be that person to kick off the meeting, introduce kind of why you're here, um, who's going to kind of talk about the different asks. Um, it's always great to have at least one person who's taking notes. So, um, you know, if the staffer does have questions that you don't know the answer to, or um, every year we end up finding out a new either member or staffer who has a personal connection. Um, so that's always great for us to know and, and to um, to note. Um, and then, of course, a photographer to make sure that you are taking pictures um, and folks to make sure to, to thank everyone for their time. Next slide. Um, so I'll go through these kind of um, quickly, but again, we have a couple of sort of tips and tricks for um, successful meetings and just kind of things to be aware of. So um, again, so for folks who were there last year, we were there when it was out of session. So that means members were back home in their home states and districts. So it was just staff that were walking the halls. 
it is a completely different environment when the house is in session. So you will have, if you came last year and you're now coming this year, you'll have it, it's, you'll see it's a much busier experience. People are running all over the place. There's hearings, there's votes, there's all different sorts of things going on. So um, flexibility is key. Um, there might be last minute changes to your meeting schedule. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. Um, you might be meeting in a hallway or in kind of a corner of an office instead of you know sitting down at a, a couch. What you'll find in the House versus the Senate Senate offices tend to be bigger. There's sort of more space to meet. Um, house offices, some can be really teeny tiny and you've got five staffers that are shoved basically in a closet all on top of each other. Um, and so meeting space um, becomes at a premium. So again, don't take offense if you're standing in a hallway. You can have just as successful of a meeting standing in a hallway as you can sitting on a fancy leather couch. Um, and um, in terms of timing, so most meetings max, you'll get probably 15 minutes. Some staff may be able to take longer, maybe you'll get 20, 25, but particularly during an in-session day, particularly during March, which as I mentioned before, is this appropriation season. It's a very, very busy time on Capitol Hill. So they are going to be back to back with lots of different meetings. So that's another reason why it's really important to kind of have that plan before you go in so that you can, you know, get to the point, get the things that you need to say said um, in that allotted time. Sometimes um, your meeting might start with the member. They'll be there for five minutes and have to run and the staff will take over or they'll pop in at the end, kind of, you know, shake everyone's hand and take a photo. So again, that's why it's really important um, to, to really build that relationship with the staff. Again, like I said, if you don't know the answer to the question, that is totally okay. It's a great opportunity for follow-up. Make sure that you note it down and we'll um, either help get you the answer or we can follow up with the office directly. Um, another thing to note, if this is your first time coming to Capitol Hill, many of the staff are very young. Um, some of them are fresh out of college. If they're not fresh out of college, some of them might look like they're fresh out of college or even younger. Um, so don't don't let that um, dissuade you from you know still having a great conversation with them. Um, young as they may be, they have a lot of influence and and a lot of power and a lot of um, you know opportunity to um, you know help build priorities for their boss. So um, don't be uh, don't be too shocked by that. Um, do try and stay with your groups. We don't want, you know, folks to, to get lost. Um, and again, as I've said several times today, advocacy is not a one-time activity. So that follow-up is really key. Um, and we will help you with that too. We've got, a, we'll have a template letter of kind of a thank you and follow-up that, um, you'll be able to send to your offices afterwards. Um, so you can kind of continue that drumbeat. Um, and so I think, oh, Next slide. Okay, so um, I haven't looked at the question box yet because I tend to get distracted if I look at the questions while I'm presenting, but um, perhaps there's a question in there about scheduling. So um, for Call in Congress, we take care of all of your scheduling needs. And by we, I mean our lovely consultants, Soapbox. Um, and so they are the ones that are reaching out to the offices building your schedule um, and and um, making those meetings with your member of Congress. So you will receive your schedule um, first from Soapbox on, I believe it's March 7th, whatever that Friday before Call on Congress is. So that's when you will get an email from Soapbox with your initial schedule. So Olivia very lovely kind of put um, a sample of what that email will look like. Um, definitely if on that Friday you haven't received an email, check your spam folder and or email us and let us know. But you'll get um, access to their mobile tool. So you don't have to download anything. It's not an app, but you click this link and then everything that you need to know for your meeting is there. So you'll have your schedule, who else is on your team, um, helpful documents. So you'll have those letter appropriations letters that I mentioned um, and a couple of other things. And then all in that same app, you'll be able to put feedback, you'll be able to put notes like, hey, this staffer has a personal connection to colorectal cancer, or um, they had this question, you can 
enter it all in through the app. Or I say it's an app, but again, it's just a it's just a link. Um, so be on the lookout for that and know that when you first get that initial email from Soapbox, you're likely to have a lot of TBDs on your schedule. Congress is notorious for doing things last minute, including scheduling meetings. So it is very common for your schedule to change um, and be updated in the days and hours before you actually go to the Hill. So don't freak out if you have a bunch of TBDs when you first get that email, they will come online. Next slide. So the last thing I just want to plug, and then I will get to questions, um, is that, so we talked a little bit at the beginning about United in Blue. So for the folks who, again, this is their first time attending, United in Blue is a flag installation on the National Mall that's dedicated to raising awareness around the growing number of young people that are being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. So a few years ago, a statistic came out that by 2030, colorectal cancer is expected to be the number one cancer killer for those under the age of 50. So we plant over 27,000 blue flags on the National Mall that represent the number of young people expected to be diagnosed in 2030. So it's a really powerful um, visual rep representation um, of this community and of what we're facing. And it is on the front lawn of Congress. So when they look out their window, this is what they will see. Um, and so as part of that, we have um, what's called our tribute wall. And so this is an opportunity for um, folks to submit um, a photo, a name, um, a brief message about someone who is um, fighting this disease, someone who we want to honor, um, kind of any anything that you would like. Um, and then their their image, their name will be reflected um, in the physically in the um, United and Blue installation on our our tribute wall and will be um, available online as well. So, Liv put the um, link in the chat. So um, the deadline for if you want your loved ones or yourself, your photo um, on the National Mall, um, the deadline is the end of this week. So I would definitely encourage folks to, um, to check that out. So now I will take a look at the questions. Um, so again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, or the chat. Um, how long has Fight CRC been asking for the CDMRP? So um, by way of sort of brief history, um, we are, Fight CRC's founder, Nancy Roach, helped get colorectal cancer as part of the peer-reviewed cancer research program back in its inception. So there was one year, um, the first year of the peer-reviewed cancer research program Colorectal cancer was not included, but since that second year, colorectal cancer has been included. We have been advocating, I believe this is our third year now for um, colorectal cancer to have its own program. So um, it's definitely challenging. This um, CDMRP has gotten a lot more attention um, in recent years as, you know, kind of another vehicle for medical research. Um, we've also been in pretty challenging budget environments. So um, it's definitely, um, you know, kind of a challenge to to um, get this, um, you know, uh, through the finish line. Um, but each year we've built the, no the number of members of Congress who have supported this ask. So we're making good progress on kind of building that level of support and, and continuing to push things forward. Um, will we know if our legislators have signed on to any of the asks? Um, so... We will do our best. Um, the um, mem so in the House, Congressman Payne's office, and in the Senate, um, Cong or Senator Booker's office, they manage sort of the incoming um, members who are signing on to the letters. So we will get kind of the most recent update from them as to who signed on to the letter. But it's likely that this will be early on in the process. So, um, again, if you've been to call on Congress before, sometimes um, this has been at the tail end of the process where the letters are um, closing or soon to close. Um, this will likely be at the beginning of the process when the letters will be fresh, so to speak. So we'll be able to kind of have the first bite at the apple at um, getting folks to sign on. Um, 
Next question, um, what specific dollar amount are we asking for in the DOD CDMRP for colorectal cancer? I think last year we asked for 20 million. That is correct. We will be likely asking for 20 million again, um, but we're kind of going back and forth with our champion offices now to determine if we wanna tweak that at all, but that will be finalized obviously before you all get to DC, but it's likely that we'll continue to ask for 20 million. Um, do we know? Oh, okay. I think what this person was at, so the um, stat that I said about the number of colorectal cancer applications that came into the peer-reviewed cancer research program and the amount that were ultimately funded. So um, these are programs that are um, not necessarily started yet. Um, so this is, you know, an application for funding. So um, 25 of them were deemed meritorious. So we have to assume that um, some of them just, you know, were deemed not quite up to snuff to or, or not ready perhaps to be funded. Um, but then there was obviously those that um, were deemed meritorious and, and weren't funded. And so, um, we will actually have a researcher who was funded through the peer reviewed cancer research program who I won't put on the spot, but I do think is on this webinar. Um, and he could maybe speak to kind of what happens when, um, you know, a, a application is rejected and, and sort of what happens from a science perspective. Um, and he'll be um, in DC with us and, and presenting on his work. Um, will Dr. Mark Green be at the rally? Should I reach out to his office and invite him? Um, Mark Green will be at the rally. So he um, has officially accepted, so he will be at the rally and will be speaking. Um, but I would, um, it sounds like this person knows him, so I would definitely encourage you to reach out and let him know that you will be there and, and look forward to seeing him um, speak at the rally. Um, do we have a summary PDF to live leave with the rep or staff? Yes. So for those who were there last year, um, and I wish I had it with me to show off, but we had a really um, beautiful sort of tri-fold document that had information on each ask, um, information on colorectal cancer, and then had a um, sort of blank section on the back where you could write a note um, if you wish. So we will have those available for you to leave with the office. So they'll have all of the information on each of the asks um, and on colorectal cancer. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity to, um, we'll have extras. So for offices that we don't have meetings with, if folks are interested in doing drop-offs, we'll have that opportunity. And then you can write kind of a personal note or write about your story um, on those leave behinds. And um, they'll also get that information digitally from us as well. Um, the tribute wall is for anyone. So it is not just for people who have passed, it is for um, people who are at the beginning of their journey, in the middle of their journey, um, wherever. So anyone is welcome on the tribute wall. Um, if we have to be at the airport at one on Tuesday, is it okay to miss some of the events? Um, yes. So um, whoever this person is, if you could just email us, um, Liv will put our advocacy email in the chat just to let us know. So that probably means you'll just be able to um, participate in meetings in the morning. Um, and so we'll just need to flag that for Soapbox. Um, but obviously we understand that, you know, people have, um, you know, their own schedules and, and need to um, come and go. So totally fine. Um, okay. Um, no silly questions. I haven't even read the question yet, but, um, when we are talking about these asks, are members in Congress of staff knowledgeable of the acronyms of these programs or should we plan to use the full names? That's a great question. So um, a little insider tip about staff, um, for better or for worse, many staff will, um, if they don't know, they'll pretend to know. Um, so um, I would, at least start by using the full names, but um, for most staff that you're gonna be meeting with, for example, for um, CDMRP, it's a very common program. So most staff will recognize that. Um, but again, you'll have that on your sheet in front of you. So you'll have the full congressionally directed medical research program. 
Um, so I would um, tend to just start with sort of the full names. Um, and then if it's easier, you can move to acronyms. But um, for the colorectal cancer control program, the CRCCP, um, that one may be less familiar to staff um, because it's colorectal cancer specific. Um, so that one I would definitely um, try and use the full name um, of the program. And, and just sort of bigger picture, you will get some staff who are very familiar with these programs, have worked on them, know them inside and out. And you will have some staff who are maybe brand new to the office or brand new to the issue area um, and know very little about it. So um, I tend to suggest that you approach it as if um, they don't know anything about the program. And you can always say, you know, not sure if you're familiar, but this and that. And, and they'll, you know, maybe say, oh, you know, I've worked on it in, in this way and, and kind of give you a sense of, of how much they understand. But um, certainly on you know, your experience and your story, um, that is where I would really emphasize that they have very little knowledge. So of course there's staff and there's members that have a personal connection. Um, but, um, you know, I think a lot of people, um, you know, don't know a lot about colorectal cancer. And so to be able to share your experience and your story, um, is going to be really, really illuminating for, both members and staff. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm 100% committed to presenting the three asks, but there's more, right? Yes. Um, I just returned from Mayo where I had my colonoscopy and the three GI providers said their biggest priority is to make sure health insurance providers are covering colonoscopy when providers order it. Is there a place for this during call on Congress? If not, can you steer us how to pursue this? Okay, great question. So like I said before, I totally understand and agree that there's many other issues that we care about as a community. It's a free country. I'm not gonna tell you what you can and cannot talk about, but I would really encourage you to stick to the three asks. One, three already is sort of like the max of what um, most offices, most staffers can kind of take in in one meeting. Two, we are much stronger if we're all kind of singing from the same songbook and, and sharing the same message. Um, so I'd love to talk to you more um, offline about kind of the particulars of what you're talking about, but we've um, advocated for, um, you know, um, if a person gets a non-invasive colorectal cancer screening test to make sure that that follow-up colonoscopy if they get a positive result um, is covered by insurance. We certainly, um, you know, would advocate for um, folks that, you know, have signs and symptoms and need to get a colonoscopy or are able to do so. We've advocated for folks that need surveillance colonoscopy, um, uh, you know, more often than the sort of 10-year traditional window um, to be able to get coverage. So, um, there's a lot of nuances in that in terms of type of insurance coverage, um, type of procedure, all of those things. So would love to chat more about that, but absolutely there's there's opportunities um, to explore all of those different policy areas. Um, and I think that's what, you know, we love kind of hearing from folks on the challenges that they're having and to see if there's ways um, that we can develop policy solutions around those things. Um, is everything, attend as you can or mandatory for Sunday, Monday, trying to keep medical issues in mind. Um, so um, nothing is mandatory. Um, we would obviously love for you to attend as much as you can. I would say the way to think about Sunday is um, if you really Sunday doesn't start until the afternoon. So you can come, of course, in the morning and sort of hang out and you have that free time. As Kathy said, you can explore D.C. We're right off the National Mall in the hotel. You can go to see some museums, check out the National Mall. Um, but the um, Fight CRC Resource Expo, that ultimately is optional. If you if you want to kind of save your gusto for Monday and Tuesday, totally, you know, take time, the, the time that you need to um, you know, do what you need to do. So definitely don't feel like it's mandatory. 
Um, but it will be a really great opportunity to one, kind of understand the different resources that Fight CRC and our partner organizations have available. So um, kind of through all different parts of the cancer journey, we're going to have um, resources on mental health, on diet, um, on different treatment options, kind of all different sorts of things. Um, and we'll kind of have some fun elements to it um, as well and, and ways to kind of get to know each other. But again, not mandatory. Um, on Monday, I would very much encourage you to come for as much of Monday as you can. That'll be our training day where, again, we'll kind of dive into these issues. Um, but we've had this webinar. We've got the um, online training. So you should have what you need. But again, if you need to sort of um, allocate your time on Monday, I would encourage you to come for the afternoon session where we'll get your soapbox schedule and you'll have time to meet with your team. Um, that's probably... Um, the most important part of the day that you would maybe not want to miss. Um, and then Tuesday when we go to the Hill, you know, if there's any sort of, um, uh, you know, things that we should know about your schedule or um, kind of what you need, again, just shoot us an email and we'll do our best to um, accommodate everyone's, um, everyone's needs. Um, okay. I participated in CDMRP PR, CRP peer review in November it was a full circle moment from calling Congress in March. It changed my life. That's amazing. So yes, as I mentioned, um, the DOD Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program um, has consumer reviewers who um, review the applications that come in. So this is a really awesome opportunity um, for patients to have a seat at the table and help kind of steer what, direct, what research gets funded um, and what's important and what's not. So um, I think that's amazing that you were able to do that and um, not to put you on the spot, but hopefully we can hear more about your experience um, when we're all in DC. Um, okay, flag planting, placing them in the ground. Can you use a litter picker? Um, that's a good question. Um, I can't say I have a deep familiarity with litter picker to see if it would work, but um, <clears throat> definitely worth a try. Some of it will depend on um, the weather. Um, so the first year that we did United in Blue, when we showed up that morning to plant flags, there was a very thin layer of snow on the ground. Um, so as you can imagine, the ground was um, a little tough. Um, so putting the flags in the ground was um, a little bit tougher. Um, but again, we are we'll do our best to make any accommodations if you need, you know, we'll have chairs available. Um, and again, sometimes it's just, um, there's other jobs at flag planting besides kind of bending over and putting the flags in the ground. So um, we'll, there's other opportunities if, um, you know, if it's not good for your back to be bending over and putting the flags in the ground. So um, we can definitely find another job for you. And one of those jobs could just be encouraging the people who are putting the flags in the ground. That's a very important thing too. So um, okay, I think there are some, um, okay, will there be any accommodations for individuals in need of DME? Um, yes, so again, if you um, have or need a wheelchair in DC, please shoot us an email um, beforehand and we will um, we will make sure that you're accommodated. So, um, if we need to kind of rent something for you in DC or make sure that, um, you kind of have those capabilities, we will make sure that, um, that's all taken care of. Just please, um, shoot us an email at advocacy at fightcrc, um, dot org. Um, and then are we able to bring photos of our loved ones? Absolutely. So, um, if you are there on behalf of a loved one and want to, um, share their story and have a photo of them, I think that's a, a wonderful thing. So um, definitely encourage you to do that if you're comfortable with it. Um, and I think is, um, you know, definitely a, a great and effective way to tell your story. Okay. Um, it appears that there are no reps in the CRC caucus west of Nebraska. Is this a short-term anomaly or a longstanding issue? Um, I would say... Um, I don't, I, I couldn't really tell you what that is. So the caucus, um, has, was, um, basically has to be restarted every two years. So the house, um, a, a Congress is two years. So house members are up for election every two years. Um, and so we are, 
um, just sort of in the middle of the the current Congress. So um, to, you know, it's just sort of a nature, um, a matter of um, maybe those offices haven't been asked or, um, you know, maybe we just need to get some more advocates um, that are west of, of Nebraska. Um, but this is the perfect opportunity to help build out our support in that part of the country. So um, I have a lot of faith that we'll be able to build out that contingent this March. Um, do I have people that I will be with this year? Um, okay, so everyone in the chat, their name is coming up as Olivia. So whoever you're reading, I can't see who you are. Okay, um, I had a feeling that maybe this is actually. So um, we, this is actually a great question because there's a lot of folks um, who, we have certain states that a lot of people are coming from a state. So California, for example, obviously huge state. We've got a lot of people coming from California. So the California group will most likely be broken up to maybe three or four different groups so that there's not, um, you know, 20 people going to each meeting. But then there's also states where maybe we only have one person from. Um, and so we will not let anyone go alone unless you really want to. <laughs> um, so um, this particular person, Ashley, um, she, she was stuck with me last year going around because she was the sole person from Nebraska. So we'll have to look and see if there's any other folks, but either we'll match you from with other people from your state, or if there's not another person from your state, we'll match you with someone from a nearby state so that you all can kind of go together with to people from your region. Or um, we will have either, you know, myself or another one of our staff or mentors um, who have, you know, kind of had experience at calling Congress and gone around before, um, we'll match you with them so that, um, you know, you're not alone and you kind of have a buddy to, to go to these different offices with. Um, but yeah, Ashley and I had a great time. We had a great experience. Um, and, um, she's a pro, so she, uh, you could, well, we won't make you go alone, but I know you could handle it if you, if you did. Um, and then, um, how many advocates are signed up to attend this year? Great question. Liv can tell us the exact answer, but it's over 200. Um, and again, over half are first time attendees, which is really, really cool. Um, so, um, you know, I think Kathy spoke to it earlier. Um, Ashley was a first time attendee last year. Um, it's, just a really amazing opportunity to connect with other people from the colorectal cancer community. It's an amazing, amazing group of people. Um, I just think there's just nothing like it. And I know that you all have an amazing experience. Okay. This all seems very overwhelming as a first call in Congress attendee. Is it fast paced and as overwhelming as it sounds? I'll say yes and no. So I don't, I know that this is overwhelming because it's a lot of information. And part of it is that we just want to tell you all of the things and all of the questions that you might have. But again, when you're there in the moment, we'll have a lot of activities for you to do, but we've also really tried to carve out downtime that you can be in small groups with your state, with the groups that you're going around on the Hill with, so you can get to know those people and kind of get comfortable in these issues in what you're going to say. Um, and so in terms of sort of, um, the pace, you know, I went through things really quickly today. We'll have a lot more time in DC. We're going to have, a, this was, you know, an hour and a half. We'll have a whole day, all of Monday in DC to kind of walk through, um, all of these issues in more depth. You'll hear from, um, like I said, a researcher who's funded um, by the DOD who's doing colorectal cancer research to so kind of get a better idea of the program and, you know, what it really means. Um, we'll have um, someone who's a grantee of the colorectal cancer control program. So again, you'll kind of get to know what these programs look like on the ground um, and kind of dive into them a little more. Um, and you if you're feeling overwhelmed, we have so many resources at your disposal. And by that, I mean people who wanna help you. So myself, Olivia, Brian, there's a whole team of Fight CRC staff that is some of whom are on the call today and they're hidden, um, but many more that you'll meet when you're in DC who want nothing more than to hold your hand through this process, um, literally or figuratively, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, 
And there's also all of the call on Congress mentors. There's people like Kathy who have been before. Um, there's other folks who are, you know, five and 10 year veterans of call on Congress who want to welcome you into this community and into this process and this experience. Um, so I know it can feel a little overwhelming, but I promise that we're here for you um, and that we will help get you what you need. Um, and so I think that you'll be able to have a really wonderful experience. But again, if there's things, um, you know, like I said, we're going to go over this in a lot more depth um, in person in DC. But if there's things in the meantime that you are, you know, worried about or have questions about, again, shoot us an email at advocacy at fightcrc.org. We're happy to jump on the phone. We're happy to answer an email and kind of talk through things. Um, and again, I saw someone just put in the chat, like, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to speak our truth. And that is so true. So as much as, you know, we encourage you to familiarize yourself with the ask and get to know them. Again, the most powerful part of this is you sharing your story and you going into that, you know, members of Congress office and saying like, this is what's happening. This is what's not acceptable anymore um, or is never acceptable, but this is what we need to change. Um, and so, you know, I think if you're starting to get overwhelmed, just take it back to that because you are an expert in your own story and you know how to share the experiences that you've been through. And that's what is going to move the needle and what's the most powerful. So I'm sending you a hug through this webinar. You're going to be great. Um, and then, okay. How many cancer related caucuses are there? What are we up against in this space? Another great question. There are many different cancer related caucuses. So pretty much any cancer that you can think of probably has its own caucus. Um, so um, you will definitely run into offices who will say, um, we don't support anything that's disease specific. Um, particularly on the Senate side, we seem to see that more. Um, and so that can definitely be frustrating. There are some offices that kind of use that as a way to say, you know, if we say yes to one cancer, then we have to say yes to all. Or if we say yes to one disease, then we have to say yes to all. Um, and so, you know, what we try to come back with to that is that, you know, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death for men and women. Yes, this is a specific cancer, but this impacts a lot of people and to change the trajectory of this disease would help people in every single district and all throughout the country. Um, so, um, you know, really kind of bringing that home for folks. And actually this reminds me of something that I haven't talked about yet, um, is that um, in addition to the resources that we mentioned, we will also have one pagers on your state. So you will have um, a piece of paper that has um, state specific information for colorectal cancer. Um, so that's a really helpful way to bring it home for your member of Congress of not just these national statistics, not just my story, but this is what's happening in your state as it relates to colorectal cancer. Um, so that's another kind of helpful tool to, to break through that, um, that sort of that pushback. Um, but it is, you know, imp important for us to recognize that um, members of Congress and staff are meeting with constituents in not just other cancers, but many other different types of diseases. So they are juggling a lot of different um, priorities and requests from their constituent. Um, and so that's why, you know, really taking the time to build these relationships over time and to come back year after year. I know there can be some frustration around, you know, we had these asks last year, like, you know, why isn't this done yet? And um, the the truth of it is that advocacy in this way takes time. And so I know that it can be frustrating and feel like, you know, we're repeating ourselves, but it, we have to. And, you know, each year, you know, every two years, the House turns over. So you might get a new member of Congress. Staff turns over all the time. So we have to continue to have that drumbeat and continue to push forward um, and, and year after year come back because that consistency is what will ultimately help us be successful. Um, okay. Um, connecting your story to stats then to the asks is important. I literally saw the lights go off in a staffer's eye when I did this last year. 
um, and their interest level changed. Um, I'm also the one who did the PRCRP. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think that can be um, really helpful to, to do that. And so we'll also have um, a worksheet um, available on, on that Monday training day um, to um, kind of help you you know, physically write down your story and draw those connections um, to uh, the asks. So again, that's kind of why I talked about it in the different buckets. I know everyone has a different experience. And so maybe someone connects with, you know, a screening and prevention asks more. Maybe someone connects with a research ask more. But I think regardless of what your story is, you'll be able to find a place of connection with one of our asks. Um, and so again, if that's something that you're struggling with, shoot us an email. We'll also, again, have time to do that in person um, and kind of think through that all together um, and make sure you feel confident um, going in to these meetings.